Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming and anybody surrounding us. You are more than welcome uh, to join us here at the Girls Lounge and we're gonna be talking today about relevancy in retail. So I don't, I don't think there could be a more important topic. Uh, obviously a, a very, very challenged industry. Uh, I have some wonderful experts here with me today. First of all, we have Miriam Asmar, uh, who is the Innovation Director uh, of McCann, and Kevin Ackerman, who is the Executive Director of Commerce for Visa, and Dan Head, who's the Senior Vice President of Appboy. So welcome and thank you very much uh, for joining this morning. Yay, okay, an enthusiastic audience. All right, I love that. I absolutely love that. So as I said, we're gonna be talking about relevancy in retail. And we're here, obviously, uh, in Europe, which is the birthplace to many of the most iconic uh, luxury retail brands for sure. And technology has really changed the game uh, for retail. Fast fashion, e-commerce players, uh, mobile wallets. Uh, these are all competitive weapons, new competitive weapons uh, in retail. Uh, and one of the questions that I, I have kind of to start out with, um, if retailers, come in and out of being in vogue, if you will, as often as trends themselves. How, how can the world of measurement and data that we're living in now, how, how, what kinds of solutions will they provide to retailers in terms of staying relevant? And that's jump ball, any, anybody's chat. Yes, yes, oh, we're all so polite here. All right, no, Miriam, I'm gonna have you go first. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think data is really interesting right now, obviously, for all retailers. Um, I was listening to Decode Recode this, a couple days ago, right, Kara Fisher, and talks about how they predict Amazon's going to start Am Amazon Square, where they're going to send sort of, you know, two boxes to you. One is going to have stuff. The other one's going to be empty. You're going to sort of, based off all the data and everything they know, they're going to predict what you want. You're going to kind of take what you want, put what you don't want, and send it back. So I think, for me, when you start to hear that as really like where the industry is going and as a trend you're like oh wow data is really taking over and you have to really position yourself as a thought leader being capable to use the data in an effective way to deliver ROI back. I think that's one of the best examples I've, I've heard and of course um, what, what Amazon has done now in terms of buying Whole Foods and how rapidly they've integrated that you know, in, into the whole. I mean, avocados for $1.49 uh, right after the day after it's settled, and you can now buy your Alexa and your Echo right, right yeah. in store. So Amazon's certainly a, a very, very big deal and, and obviously a, a master of leveraging, leveraging data. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? I, I think, uh, on the whole, I think that uh, Retail is the space, from my experience, from a, a technology perspective, um, that is, is certainly in the Western world making the least from the available technologies to, to innovate and create that lasting brand experience. So I don't know many, how many people here get, I don't know, it, emails, push notifications from their retail vendors and how many of them are really relevant. I know that the ones that I get sent aren't. And when I look at the market of retail, I think that there, there are some retailers who are in the category of they are just really, really successful anyway without having that connection with the customer, without really using the data that they've got at hand. And then there's another uh, section of retailers who uh, just seem to have rabbit in the headlights and they're struggling, but they're still not seeking to utilize it, which is crazy when you think that, I mean, just take um, something like uh, mobile app retention, which you know, data's proven that if, you, if a consumer engages with an app every week for the first month, they're 60% more likely to be retained. So, and, and then you look at you know, yesterday's announcement with you know, iPhone 10 and that beautiful new you know, full screen that they've got. You know, we, we look at um, what's coming across from China and how they're setting an example about how retailers should behave. So I, I think it's crazy. I think that there's, that's where the opportunity lies for retailers to actually use the data that they're sitting on. But at the moment, I don't see it. And I think to your point about retailers coming and going, there should be perhaps a bit more paranoia in the industry than there actually is. I, I think you're right. And we're going to get back to, to China in, in a minute. But I, I think uh, we just came off another panel uh, about data and creativity. And I just want to make a point about data. Um, you know, we're drowning in data. And the reality is data doesn't matter. It's the derivative of the data the consumer insight 
that is what we're really talking about. And I think in so many instances, retailers and others are not leveraging data because they're not extracting the insight. They don't know what to do with it. Um, you have a very unique uh, sort of perching post, Kevin, at, at Visa in terms of what's going on with retail. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, for us, um, obviously, you know, we, we, we see a lot of data. When someone makes a transaction in an aggregated and anonymous way, we can provide insights back to, to retailers and advertisers. Um, when someone uses cash, it's kind of invisible, so there's invisible insights, so we, we cannot provide anything to them. Um, where I would say, too, I, I think there is an enormous amount of data, and I think people get too hung up on folks thinking potentially on the wrong set data sets. Um, and I think there's a lot of third-party data that you maybe you can kind of tease the truth out of some of the things that you're seeing. Um, and then from a brand perspective, I just think there, there is going to be a lot of, um, consumers are going to be able to buy, pro engage with your brand and buy your goods on a lot of different platforms than your website um, in the future. And so how will those consumers engage with your brand when it's on a property that you don't own, but they're, they're wanting to consume and have a dialogue with you while they're in someone else's app? I think you know that that's an interesting insight right there because I think when you look at various industries traditions, the notion, for example, in say a media company, the notion that they would push their content out onto other people's properties. I mean, when that first started happening about maybe 17, 18 years ago, you know, people in the media industry were apoplectic. I would never put my content, you know, on somebody else's platform. And you know, this this notion of a very open world, it's also new to retailers and, and somewhat un, unnatural uh, in many ways. So in terms of creating lasting uh, consumers, that, that's a very interesting um, data point on, on the app. But in terms of how retailers are going to create uh, long-term desire in a market that seems built for uh, speed at all costs, what are some of the things that you're seeing retailers do to create ongoing desire and therefore sales? Yeah, um, I mean, I think for me, a couple of the brands that we work on have never really had a, a sort of consumer brand proposition bigger than the product. So of course you see a lot of people really thinking, you know, marketing 3.0, brand, 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 not saying anything new there. Um, but I do think that from the standpoint now, everyone's trying to think, well, how do you start extending the experience? This is where digital and content become sort of really key. Um, if you've ever been, there's a restaurant in London called the Fat Duck Restaurant, right? The minute you get in, you get unlocked to like a website, you get new content every couple months, there's sort of new things that you're exposed to. It becomes as central to the experience as the experience itself. So I think trying to think about how you can extend it and make it a little bit more valuable for a consumer um, is really important for retailers. You know, I think that um, there's, we were talking about this earlier, about that there's a, typically, in, in creating brand value and creating brand attachment has typically been done by the brand marketers and the agencies serving those brand marketers. And technology's either been used as a uh, one-off sort of campaign tool, or it's deemed to be some sort of IT platform, like you buy your Excel licenses for your business. But the reality is that technology now is as much of a creative canvas as video is for brand marketers. And I, I, I'm starting to see um, some retailers look at it that way, but they certainly don't look at it in the same way that a true digital first business, like um, a delivery hero or a train line or a lift would do. That's right, Kevin, Kevin comments yeah, on that? Yeah, I was just going to say, man, I think there's a really good example um, where I think some of it has to come from a top down of the organization. They have to be passionate about their product and creating these experiences to keep that consumer engaged with their brand long term. Um, and so the, the best recent example I was reading about, Elon Musk with Tesla, and someone had put on Twitter to him that made a, a suggestion how to make his product better. And he answered and he said, that's a great idea. And in seven days, he pushed that improvement out to all Tesla owners. And it got this viral thing that, you know, he, he heard a suggestion from a consumer, and because it's a technology type of product, he's able to push that 
to the consumer in near real time. So it's really incredible. It, it, it's a great example of what creating a relationship with a consumer is, is all about. And you know, I, I think it, it's a little bit overused. You know, I want to engage with my customer and all that, but that, that is one of the best examples um, recently of how this can work, but it also speaks to the speed. The speed. And I think that, look, Elon Musk is Elon Musk and Tesla, you know, couldn't, couldn't find an example of more contemporary products or uh, contemporary ways to market. But one of the things that I think is a great opportunity for retailers is personalization. And again, thanks to technology, we have the opportunity to know so much about consumers and also to predict you know, what, what they might do. Do you have examples, anybody have examples of retailers really leveraging that data to create more personal experiences? Yeah, um, I, I would say again, in the Western world, they're few and far between in retail, but they are starting to emerge. So for example, I mean, everyone knows that uh, if you go to a website, your, you know, your previous buying behavior is probably going to likely prompt what you see next, what recommendations they make. But that's 101 and that's stuff that should have been happening years ago, right? It's 101 and yet it, we haven't even finished doing a good job there because you know, right. if you, just, you, know you just buy yep. a set of tires, what are the next set of ads you see? Tires. tires. Yep. And, and I think, you know, that talk about the consumer experience, mm. that just drives people crazy and shame on us 22 years in. I mean, Ur so Urban Outfitters is an example where I've seen a retailer start to be a bit more creative with this. So they um, partner with a location insights vendor to uh, enrich their data so that they could build in location-based habits into their targeting. So they would say, we want to um, uh, target women who like to go nightclubbing on a Friday with party dresses. And in their creation of those dynamic segments, they're using real location insights that actually shows which women in their data set actually do go clubbing and which nightclubs they go to, what sort of music they like. So then that can inform the content recommendation. And I know for that particular campaign, they saw 146% um, um, uh, revenue uplift per customer that engaged with that campaign and a 75% increase in conversions. So this stuff really works. It works, and yeah. It really works, it's just like you said uh, right at the start, marketers just seem to have a bit of a sort of rabbit in the headlights about using the data they're sitting on. Well, you know, I think another thing that, that comes to mind is, you know, personalization doesn't sound like an opportunity to scale, and scalability is, is, is so critical. Is that a good assumption that personalization isn't really built to scale, or do you think that we're, we're at a point where, where we really can, thanks to technology? Um, I, I mean, I think personalization goes beyond even just the people, and you can think about things even as much as like the weather, for example. So a great example that I saw was somebody created a model around pollution, pollen, temperature, and when you saw a certain model kind of come together, we're selling cold medicine, because that's when everyone gets sick. John Lewis, I think another great example. Great retailer. These guys know, you know, when the temperature drops, everyone's buying cashmere, and that's kind of what's updating in your ads around. Um, when it's hot outside, everyone wants board games and things for picnics. So I think that personalization, yes, of course, it can be for the people, but I think thinking about it a little bit broader about conditions and how they might affect the way a person would feel is another way to think how it can scale. I think that that's a, a great perspective because personalization is often interpreted as, ah, here we go, one-to-one -one marketing. Mm -hmm. But I think personalization can be many, many different things, and I think that, that's where the scale, scale yeah, comes exactly. in. Kevin, yeah, I was going to say, I, I just think too, um, because consumers know that all this data exists, they kind of expect you mm -hmm. to be, to, to understand them and who they are and have personalization. So I think when all this data exists, and you know, I just assume that my bank or my retailer I go to all the time, they have all this data on me, it should be personalized, and when it's not, I think that's where consumers start to disengage with their brand because they, they, there's an expectation that the data exists, I shouldn't have to give it to you, you should be able to get it by other means sometimes, and that, that brand, uh, that message should be personalized to me. I, that, that is a very interesting, because I know, like, when I walk into a hotel that I've been to for many times, and you know, they say, oh, is this your first time with us? Horrible. Like, are you serious? 
the Delta Sky Club is an interesting one because I am, I am the highest level Delta flyer you can get. Every time I walk into the club, they say, you know, can I tell you about the club? I'm like, no, I could tell you about the club. I know more about this club <laughs> than you do. And, and so I finally asked somebody one day, why is that? And they said it was privacy. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because I think on something very basic, like I'm a club member, yeah. and you can tell how many times I'm in this club. And they said, no, it's a big privacy issue with us. And I thought that was really interesting. And, I, and I'm thinking about, I don't know, if I were you know, the club girl every Friday night, I'm not sure I want you to know that. Um, so where a, does privacy yeah. you know, sort of fit yeah. into to all of this? It's probably more of a laziness issue for them rather than a privacy issue, right? Because if they were actually if they were actually seeking to uh, uh, gain permission, gain opt-ins, gain subscriptions, and actually making that part of their marketing program to ask in the first place and explain to their consumers why it's value added to opt in and give permission. And what then, the use of that data right. is, the clarity on that, yeah. Yeah, I think this is why I was really interested kind of in the China question, because I think that this is why on some level they are much better at using data than we are, because if you think of it like kind of a computer, they're, they're Apple, right? They're a closed system. They kind of know everything that's happening. They can tell you what you want next because they have all the data knowing exactly what it is. And, and so you follow and you go there. So this is, I do think that there are, I respect the fact that, I mean, I, I agree with you, it's really annoying. I respect the fact that they're in place, but I do think that, yeah, what's the right balance? How do we start to kind of be able to personalize things like a little bit more without feeling like we're infringing on people's privacy in order to provide a better experience to consumers? I, I have an interesting, oh, sorry, Kevin. I was just going to say, I, I also think like we found at Visa, some of our products, that consumers will opt in and allow us to look at their transaction history with, and they're opting into it, with, with with the relevance that they're going to get really relevant offers that pertain to their prior spend. So if they think they're going to get something out of it, they really have, you know, the, the mass consumers don't have a problem giving up some information if they think it's going to be used properly and they're going to get some relevance out of it. No, they, they recognize the value exchange. Yeah. Right. Uh, I have an interesting um, stat on, on China here. So as you know, uh, in, in that vast uh, country, uh, live streaming is, is mainstream. And according to some PwC research, 200 million of China's 730 million internet users, 730 million, are watching those broadcasts on at least one of 200 Chinese apps. If you think about, I mean, talk about scale. So how, how are retailers in that sense leveraging sort of the scale of, of this medium and other emerging uh, communications platforms and using the data to convert uh, viewers into shoppers. Anybody familiar with how that's working? Uh, no, I mean, like, I, I think from my standpoint, I, I think retailers just have to get, that, that's where things are going. You, you have to get your products and your brand and your message inside the apps that consumers are using and it might not be your app, it might be, uh, their banking app or their social media apps that they use. So you, you have to figure out a way to get inside of where they're spending most of their time. And I think they, in China, they've done a really great job of creating that closed environment where you can do your banking, you can do your insurance, you can do a lot of things inside a few apps and they're consuming all the consumer's time. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Alibaba actually uh, released a piece with Boston Consulting Group about what China can teach the West about retail. And there's a lot of this um, in that. And I mean, it's everything from uh, the, the data they get from those live streaming, you know, how they use celebrities, even local farmers at certain uh, annual festivals, you know, live streaming how their produce can be used. Um, and how, uh, so there's the data you get from that, there's the, there's the data that Alibaba can share with its partners because of course in China they uh, they uh, consumers tend to interact with brands differently. They don't just have go to a, a brand distinctive website. Alibaba will be, if you like, an aggregator, and there's more of a shopping mall experience. So then, uh, so then Alibaba can start making these these insights about people's behavior and their likes more available and then more personalized. Uh, for example, they released a bunch of location data around Chinese Valentine's Day about where singles were hanging out, and they sort of and other retailers could attach their brand to that. Um, but I suppose the, the, the point is, is that that's a very good example and retailers in the West should be aware of just 
how big the gulf is between their execution in this space and what's going on in China. And they've got to be careful as well because obviously Chinese, to your point about Tesla and their ability to act on what's going on and affect that change, of course, China's got an advantage because all the manufacturing is done out there as well anyway. So they can go from, they can go from consumer behavior to product re-engineering to execution and supply chain and delivery way faster than we can do in the West. Well, I think, you know, sort of speaking of um, forces uh, that happen, if you, if you look at what's gone on in the Caribbean uh, this mm. week and the southeastern part of the United States with Hurricane Irma, uh, the potential economic impact, uh, the lost sales, if you will, are expected to be nearly one and a half billion dollars just in that, in that part of the world. So one of the, the questions that comes out of that would be how can retailers leverage data to prepare for and mitigate um, peaks and troughs, if you will, caused by unforeseen, uh, from a long-term standpoint, short-term standpoint, you know, we all had, you know, probably 10 days, 10 days warning, but how, how can we use data from, from a retail standpoint, if the loss is a, a billion and a half now, how could we have made it half of that? Leveraging, leveraging data. Is that something that we need to look at? Uh, yeah, um, yes, and I mean, if you look at, I mean, retailers, there are certain events like Black Friday that they'll plan all year for, right? And I think the problem here is here is agility of the fact that retailers haven't really worked out their various muscle groups to make the most of this data and then be able to do something about it. So if they, if they did know how to, and if they had mechanisms to automate customer journeys based on weather, based on uh, some fashion event or, or, or uh, something in the media. If, if, they, were, if they were able to, uh, because you know, use technology for what technology is good at, you know, process large volumes of data to indicate perhaps what the most preferable journey for a customer to go down is based on circumstances, internal data, first party as well as third party. If they had actually thought about what this means architecturally from a technology perspective and had actually iterated and practiced and worked out their various muscle groups, then when these things happen, they wouldn't be caught off guard. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah Miriam. This is where I think the models and the modeling becomes really important then as well. Thinking about the correlations, like if this, then that. So we talked about kind of like the bee pollen and everything. So we, this is a trend, hurricanes come, every single year, there definitely has to be a lot of big data that exists around kind of how people evacuate, where they're going, what are the number one supplies that they can make. This is where I think you just have to start modeling and then using maybe a little bit of personalization, weather predicting, to serve up kind of that right message and that right marketing piece, again, to convert to sales and mitigate the loss on the bottom yeah, line. It's kind of extraordinary, you, know, you read very early on, oh yeah, this region is out of water. Why? You knew it was coming. Exactly. So it, exactly. You don't have to lose a billion and a half. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. So unfortunately, we have time for just one more question. And I'd like to focus that on speed of delivery, if you will, versus quality. Um, and how retailers are, are striking a balance between the two. So speed and quality in both manufacturing, fast fashion now, um, and, and, and marketing. So I'd, I'd love anybody's thoughts on, on that balance. Okay, first, yeah, no, I mean, obviously I think it's really important. If you look at the US sales, H&M, Uniqlo, and Zara were the only retailers to have growth, right, in their last earnings. So clearly they've got something right with the model on going, kind of you'd rather be first than be kind of slow and not be able to sell. So even if you're doing 75% quality and getting it out there, it's going to be much better than kind of a, trying to get a 95% quality. Um, I do think this also, then when I think about kind of the marketing of those products, this goes to our conversation earlier about having the right digital infrastructure and the right technology at the core, because if you have that in place, then when you get new products in and they're coming up, that should just automate, automatically update in sort of a dynamic ad or something that somebody's seeing. There should be no manual part of you having to upload or do anything from the marketing side. So, you know, paid social, programmatic, SEO, that's an always on thing that if a retailer you don't have nailed down, you're always going to struggle with getting your products quickly into marketing. Um, yeah, that's a great, great and point, just, Kevin. Uh, from our perspective, I mean, we do a lot with measurement for retailers to give them a quick idea of how like a campaign's performing. Um, 
and we can we can produce that data very quickly for them to say the campaign's performing well when it's mid mid flight. It's what they do with it. Can they course correct and and swap in and swap out and, and do it? And I think you know that's where you know we we step aside. We provide the data. Um, I think sometimes it gets lost on how quickly they can mobilize and change when something isn't working. Well, I, and that, again, it goes back to the infrastructure. You know, do they have the right tools to be able to do that uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, the willingness to participate in, in a world that they didn't grow up in. So that's crazy. Dan, any, any last words on this? Uh, just that, uh, again, there are a whole bunch of new kids on the block, whether it's marketplaces like Wallapop and Depop, and you know, it versus the traditional retailers. And if you look under the cover of those businesses, how they are architected for their infrastructure, how they optimize data in their marketing stack is worlds away from traditional retailers who have, who has still have built their marketing architecture often on top of 20 year old email technology. So there's latency inherent throughout the architecture, which means they can't respond um, which means they can't personalize, they can't use the data they're sitting on, and it's like a friend of mine at um, uh, the Racing Post said to me, no one wants to bet on a horse that lost yesterday. And I think a lot of the retailers are in that environment. Yeah, well, one of the things I like to say is, you know, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. So there you go. Thank you very much for joining thank us, you. and thank you all, appreciate it.